The Complete History of Angels, Cherubims, Seraphims, Watchers, and Lucifer. Bible Today, we're going to focus on biblically accurate heavenly beings. But before we do, let's explore how the vast majority of people incorrectly view these celestial entities. Typically, when someone thinks of heavenly beings, the common image that pops into many minds is that of angels, often portrayed as human-like figures with large feathery wings often bearing halos and sometimes carrying harps or trumpets these figures deeply embedded in the cultural and religious tapestries are typically depicted as human-like beings adorned with wide feathery wings and radiant halos and occasionally musical instruments like harps and trumpets this depiction been heavily influenced by renaissance art literature and later popular culture historically art and literature have played pivotal roles in shaping our understanding and perception of such celestial entities from the eel paintings of raphael and belly to the verses of John Milton's Paradise Lost Angels, have been given human qualities making them relatable and yet otherworldly. This anthropomorph morphism reflects humanity's desire to comprehend the divine to bridge the vast chasm between the mortal and the eternal. Furthermore, movies, television shows, and even holiday imagery, particularly in the Western world, have further solidified this depiction, often diluting the profound spiritual significance of these beings into mere decorative ideas or fantastical characters. Heavenly beings are not cute or fluffy beings that spend their days playing with harps. They are unimaginably powerful beings. They do not look like Cupid. They are real spirit beings with real power. The sheer fact that this heavenly beings are able to stand in the presence of the Lord and see the face of the Lord reveals their power. You and I in our mortal bodies and with all of its sin cannot stand and see the face of the Lord. For the word of God tells us no man has seen God and lived. But angels can see the Lord listen to how angel Gabriel introduces him. Luke 1 verse 19, the angel replied and said to him, I am Gabriel, I stand and minister in the very presence of God, and I have been sent by him to speak to you and to bring you this good news. What an introduction, Gabriel stands in the very presence of the Lord. If you and I were to see the face of the Lord in all of his holiness and all his glory, our spirit would leave our body faster than we can blink angels. One angel killed 185000 Assyrian soldiers in one night angels. One angel shut the lion's mouths. Angels and angel rolled away the stone from Jesus' tomb. Angels one angel guided Philip to the Ethiopian Unsi for a divine appointment. Angels and angel freed Peter from Herod's prison. These benevolent beings are sent by God as messengers, protectors, and guides for humanity. However, she rams while under the broad umbrella of heavenly entities stand distinctly apart from the traditional angels both in function and appearance. They are not standard angels, and they are not even archangels. They are unique. They are their very own type of heavenly being distinct from standalone angels. The Bible gives us several detailed descriptions of the she-rams that starkly contrast the commonly held perception of. Angels the most vivid portrayed Karam is in the book of Ezekiel 1 verses 5 to 11. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a cow's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went, they went everyone straight forward as for the likeness of their faces. They four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upwards. Two wings of everyone were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. Ezekiel 10 verse 20 and 22. This is the living creature that I saw under God of Israel by the river of Chaber and I knew that they were the cherubims. Everyone had four faces apiece, and everyone four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings, and the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river of Chaber their appearance, and themselves they went everyone straight forward in Ezekiel's vision. The Kapcharim are described as having multiple faces, that of a man aligned an ox and an eagle right here in the appearance of this. Heavenly being, we encounter one of the most intriguing aspects of the creature, it has multiple faces, that of a man, a lion, an ox, and the eagle. So we have a heavenly creature that has the faces of creatures on this earth. We know that cherubim were created before the creation of the world. Because in the book of Job we see the sons of God. God, which was angels, shouted for joy when God created the earth from Job 38 verses 6 to 7. We clearly understand that angels predate the creation of the earth. Therefore, 
They also predate the creation of all living creatures on this earth in simple terms that means they predate the creatures that they resemble, isn't that? Intriguing after studying this area of scripture, I never looked at humans, lions, oxen, and eagles the same way this point might not blow your mind. But when I understand that this heavenly creature has these four faces, yet it predates all of these four creatures, I was completely amazed. So here we have the cherubim, and I think we can all agree that cherubim are unique creatures. They bear the resemblance of earthly creatures that were not created when the she-ram themselves were created. This is why I describe these wonderful heavenly creatures as the most mysterious ones, because they clearly have a connection to the earth. But the Bible does not reveal a tremendous amount of information about them. Imagine the sight of this extraordinary creature before your eyes, the Shiram, as described in the passages of Ezekiel. Four faces gaze upon you, the human, the lion, the ox, and the eagle, all unified within one being, its form human-like. Yet eel adorned with four wings that seem to carry it effortlessly through the heavens, straight legs and feet like polished bronze reveal a majestic presence. While beneath those mighty wings, human hands exude both power and grace. Can you fathom the mix of emotions flooding through you at the sight of this? Celestial being fear and wonder intertwine as you find yourself both terrified and moved by its presence. The realization of standing before a creature with such divine significance humbles your soul. For the She-Ram is no ordinary being. They guard the very presence of the Almighty. Can they be classified as an angel? Cherubim are a specific type of celestial beings mentioned in the Bible. They are often associated with angels and are considered a high-raking order of angels. However, it is important to note that she rams and angels are not necessarily interchangeable terms, as not all angels are described as charam in the Bible. Sharam are tasked with guarding God's presence and serving in heavenly worship. They are closely associated with God. God's throne, on the other hand, angels in a more general sense refer to the spiritual beings who serve as messengers of God and carry out various tasks according to God's will. The term angel is used in a broader sense to describe different ranks and functions of heavenly beings, including messengers, protectors, and guides. Some angels are mentioned by name in the Bible, such as Michael and Gabriel, and they have specific roles in certain biblical events, so while she rams can be considered a specific type of angel, not all angels are necessarily she ram have unique characteristics and roles that distinguish them from other angelic beings mentioned in the Bible and the spirit world. There are many celestial beings that we can't fully understand. We know some of them like the seraphim fiery creatures who stand in God's presence and shine with holiness. There are also archangels, powerful messengers from God, who bring important messages to us in the book of Revelations. We see the majestic horses in heaven with one carrying a triumphant rider on a white horse representing victory and righteousness. Can you imagine how amazing that sight would be? These celestial beings are incredibly beautiful and powerful. But let's take a moment to think while the Bible tells us about some celestial beings, there's so much that we don't know about the spiritual realm. Have you ever wondered about other celestial beings that the Bible doesn't mention? Can you picture the amazing things we will see in heaven? Isaiah 6 verses 1 to 7 in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged the nature and essence of the seraphim provide a profound glimpse into the heavenly real revealing aspects of God's character and his interaction with humanity. The term seraphim literally translates to fiery or burning wands. This description not only represents their radiant appearance, but also symbolizes the passion and intensity of their worship. This burning zeal for adoration is an embodiment of the heart's pure response to the Almighty's unmatched holiness and majesty. The very fabric of creation action, from the galaxies that stretch across the vastness of the cosmos to the intricate design of the human soul emanates from the profound brilliance of our Creator. It is only fitting then that every angel, every heavenly being, every corner of the universe, every atom and molecule should echo with songs of adoration for the one who spoke them into existence. 
God in his unmatched majesty wander, and glory did not just create the world he breathed life purpose and wanderer into it. Such a magnificent creator rightly demands our deepest reverence and ceaseless worship. And here we see that in the assembly of heaven, countless beings recognize and respond to this divine mandate God deserves to be worshipped. God is worthy of worship among this heavenly crowd of beings that we have never seen the seraphim stand out not merely as spectators, but as active participants in this eternal symphony of praise. These luminous beings with their fiery essence exemplify a worship that is both fervent and pure. Their very name which denotes burning passion signifies the intensity of their devotion it's as if they were. Forged from the very flames of worship, embodying a love that's so profound, so pure, that it can only be described as burning if these magnificent creatures, so close to the throne of God, are consumed by their desire to adore Him. How much more should we, the beneficiaries of His grace and love, be drawn to praise and honor the great Creator in the presence of such all-inspiring devotion? Let our hearts be kindled with the same fiery passion to worship and magnify the Lord of all creation. In Isaiah's encounter, a striking feature of these beings is their six wings. Two of the wings were utilized to cover their faces. This action wasn't born out of fear, but out of deep reverence and respect in the presence of the Holy One. Even the holiest of angels shielded their faces, indicating an acknowledgement of God's unparalleled glory. Another pair of wings were employed to cover their feet in biblical times. Feet were often considered the most defiled part of the body as they were continuously in contact with the ground and the dust of the earth. The seraphim covering their feet can be viewed as a symbolic gesture of humility denoting a desire to present nothing defiled before the Lord. The remaining wings had a functional purpose flight. This denotes not just the ability to move, but readiness. The seraphim are always prepared, always waiting on God, ready to respond to His commands or proclamations immediately. Their constant flight around the throne is a testament to their unending vigilance and service, but their form and function aren't the only things that capture attention. The seraphim's vocal exclamation, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory, speaks volumes about their primary mission. This isn't a casual declaration, but a deep resounding acknowledgement of a fundamental truth. The trifold repetition of the word holy isn't a mere literary device in Hebrew culture. Repetition emphasized utmost importance by declaring God's holiness. Thrice the seraphim magnified the supreme sanctity of God, a holiness unmatched and unparalleled. Additionally, the impact of their proclamation is tangibly felt with the very foundations of the temple shaking. This reaction isn't just a physical manifestation, but a spiritual one. It reminds us that true worship, born out of a genuine recognition of God's nature, has the power to move not just hearts, but also the very fabric of our surroundings, the temple filling with smoke in response to their voices. Once again emphasizes the weight of God's glory throughout Scripture. Smoke often represents God's overwhelming presence, just as with the Israelites at Mount Sinai here too. Smoke signifies a divine, palpable presence, a testament to God's active engagement with His crew. Creation continual worship is the seraphim's essence. Their entire existence revolves around acknowledging, revering, and proclaiming the majesty of God through them. We gain insight into the heart of true worship. It's not about ritual or routine, but about a genuine, passionate response to the God of all creation. As we delve deeper into the attributes and roles of the seraphim, we're led to reflect upon our own responses to God. God's holiness, the seraphim's primary purpose is to worship and declare the greatness of God. But what can we as humans learn from these celestial beings about our own relationship with the Creator? One paramount lesson the seraphim teach us is the essence of true. Worship their worship is not a periodic activity. It's easy to confine worship to specific times, places, or events. However, observing the seraphim, we're reminded that worship is not just an act. It's an attitude of the heart, a continuous acknowledgement of God's sovereignty, and every moment of our existence, moreover, the seraphim's humility, despite their grandeur and proximity to God, challenges. Our human tendencies. We often seek recognition or desire to elevate our status, but these heavenly beings in all their splendor exemplify ultimate humility, and the face of divine majesty they serve as a reminder that true greatness lies in recognizing our place before God and serving Him with a humble heart. The seraphim's act of purification, as seen in Isaiah's experience, is also a profound reflection of God's grace, just as a serape purified Isaiah's lips to prepare him for prophetic ministry. God in his mercy purifies and prepares us for our unique callings. The seraphim become instruments of God's sanctifying power, demonstrating that when God calls, 
He also equips and refines the fiery appearance of the seraphim, which resonates with their name, also carry symbolic undertones for believers. Fire in the Bible often represents purification and transformation for believers. This serves as an allegory of the transformative power of God's presence in our lives as we draw closer to Him. We undergo a process of sanctification, where the impurities of our lives are burned away, molding us more into the likeness of Christ. Another striking parallel that can be drawn from the seraphim's ceaseless proclamation of God's holiness by its very nature stands apart from the common or the ordinary. When something is described as holy, it carries with it an intrinsic set-apartness, a distinctiveness that elevates it above everything else. The seraphim and their first fent cry of holy, holy, holy aren't just acknowledging God's uniqueness, but are emphasizing an attribute of God that permeates everything He is and everything He does. His transcendent holiness, the Bible, emphasizes God's love, mercy, justice, and many other attributes. But none of these can be truly understood or appreciated without first grasping the holiness of God. His love is a holy love, not a capricious or changing affection. His justice is rooted in His holiness, ensuring that it's never arbitrary but always right and pure. Every facet of God's character, every act He undertakes is deeply entwined with His holiness. This is the foundation upon which all other attributes rest the seraphim. Those who stand in the immediate presence of God understand this profoundly. Their declaration is a stark reminder that our perception of God must always begin with His holiness. It shapes how we approach Him, how we worship Him, and how we live in response to Him. The Bible states, Be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 16 This call isn't just about moral purity, but about setting ourselves apart from God's purposes aligning our lives. With His character and seeking to reflect His image in the world, the holiness of God serves as a beacon, illuminating the darkness of our world and the shadows within our own hearts. It reveals the areas in our lives that are inconsistent with His character driving us toward repentance and transformation. Moreover, when we internalize the importance of God's holiness, it affects how we view sin. It's not just breaking a rule, it's an affront to the very nature of a holy God. And as the seraphim demonstrate, understanding God's holiness produces a profound sense of awe and reverence. It redefines our understanding of worship becomes less about routine and more about a heartfelt response to a God whose very essence is incomparable and unmatched. It moves us from passive observance to active adoration, aligning our hearts and minds with the rhythms of heaven. To truly know God is to, to know Him in His holiness as we approach the scriptures, as we pray, as we engage in worship, and as we live out our daily lives. May the cry of the seraphim echo in our souls, driving us closer to the heart of a holy God, reshaping our lives in the light of His profound holiness. As believers, we are called to be witnesses of God's love and grace, just as the seraphim unceasingly declare God's glory in the heavenly realms. We are tasked with the mission to spread the good news of God's love and salvation on earth. Finally, the seraphim's unwavering focus on God underscores the importance of fixing our eyes on the eternal, rather than the temporal, in a world filled with distractions. The seraphim exemplify what it means to have a singular focus on God. They don't waver, get distracted, or lose sight of their purpose. This steadfastness serves as an inspiration for believers to remain grounded in faith, undeterred by the challenges and distractions of the world in conclusion. While the seraphim occupy a unique place in the heavenly hierarchy, their attributes and actions serve as powerful lessons for humanity. Their undivided devotion, humility, and role as messengers of God's sanctifying grace provide a blueprint for believers guiding us towards a deeper, more genuine relationship with the Almighty. Two of the most famous angels. The Bible is a book full of angels. Angels are a fundamental part of the spiritual realm, and they play a significant role in the Bible and in the Christian faith. By learning about angels, we can gain a deeper understanding of God's plan for our lives, and we can appreciate the divine beings that are constantly working behind the scenes to protect and guide us. Now there is some confusion which takes place regarding angels. Because in some instances, believers mix up ancient Jewish texts such as the Book of Enoch with information found in the Bible. Allow me to list some angels that are named in the Book of Enoch and then after this I will list angels found within the canon of Scripture. Just to bring clarity to the matter, one Michael is one of the most well-known angels in both Jewish and Christian traditions in the Book of Enoch. He is referred to as the Holy and Great Angel and is often depicted as a warrior or protector. 2. Gabriel is another well-known angel mentioned in both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible in the Book of Enoch. He is referred to as one of the four archangels and is tasked with delivering messages from God to his people. 3. Raphael is an archangel who is often associated with healing in the Book of Enoch. He is referred to as one of the seven holy angels who watch over the earth. 
Therefore, Uriel is an archangel who is often associated with wisdom and guidance in the Book of Enoch. He is referred to as one of the four archangels and is tasked with watching over the world and its inhabitants. Five Regal is an angel who is often associated with justice and fairness. In the Book of Enoch, he is referred to as one of the seven holy angels who watch over the Earth Six. There are several other angels mentioned in the Book of Enoch and other prominent literature, each with their own unique roles and characteristics. However, we have only mentioned the most commonly known as believers. Our reference point is the Bible as believers. Our reference point is the, the canon of scripture within the canon of scripture. Only four angels are named Michael the Archangel, Gabriel, the Messenger of God, Lucifer the Fallen One, Abandon also known as Apollon the Destroyer. The two most known angels are Gabriel the Messenger of God and Michael the Archangel. The Bible tells us that the angel Gabriel is a significant figure in the spiritual realm. He is a fearsome, glorious being, who is mentioned in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and is considered one of the most prominent angels in the Bible. In some Christian circles, he is viewed as an archangel. However, the Bible never explicitly refers to him as an archangel. The first instance where Gabriel was mentioned in the Bible is in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. At this time, Daniel was living in Babylon, where the Jews were in exile. In Daniel chapter 8, Daniel has a vision of a ram with two horns and a goat with a single horn. He is unsure of the meaning of the vision and prays for an explanation in response to Daniel's prayer. Gabriel appears to him and provides him with the interpretation of the vision. Gabriel explains that the ram with two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia, while the goat with a single horn represents the king of Greece. Gabriel goes on to describe how the king of Greece will rise to power and conquer the Persian Empire. Daniel 8 verse 15 through 119. And it came to pass when I even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought. For the meaning then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision now as he was. Speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation for at the time appointed. The end shall be this encounter with Gabriel demonstrates his role as a messenger of God, tasked with delivering important messages to his people. Gabriel's appearance to Daniel signifies the importance of the vision and its meaning for the future of the Israelites. In Daniel 8 verse 8 we see that the vision and the appearance of Gabriel so shocked Daniel that he fain fainted. Gabriel revived him. This is something we need to know about angels. They are awesome creatures, marvelous and majestic creatures throughout the Bible. Gabriel is associated with delivering messages from God to his people. And this first instance of his appearance in the book of Daniel sets the tone for his important role in the spiritual realm. Gabriel makes another appearance in the book of Daniel, specifically in chapter 9, in response to a prayer made by Daniel. During this encounter, Gabriel provided Daniel with insight and understanding and also referred to the Anointed One, a term used for the Messiah, after a brief introduction. The book of Luke, which is one of the four Gospels, begins with the narrative of a priest named Zechariah. Luke notes that Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were deemed righteous in the sight of God. Zechariah was a priest who had been chosen to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to burn incense when Gabriel appeared to him. Zariah was overcome with fear. This is a natural human response when confronted with something that is beyond our understanding or experience. Gabriel reassured Zechariah not to be afraid and then proceeded to deliver the message that God had sent him to convey. Now the question is why Gabriel is there. Gabriel had been sent by God to deliver the good news that Zechariah's wife Elizabeth would conceive a son who would be named John. This was no ordinary child, for he would be the one who would prepare the way for the coming of the Lord as prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. This was a divine appointment, a fulfillment of God's promise, and Gabriel was there to deliver the message. We also see that Gabriel visited Mary to announce that she had been chosen by God to bear his son Jesus Christ. We see this in Luke 1, 26-38. So what can we learn from this encounter between Gabriel and Zechariah? Firstly, we see that God is always at work in our lives, and sometimes he sends his messengers to deliver important messages. It is important for us to be open and receptive to God's message, even if it challenges our understanding or expectations. God cares about his people, and he is watching over his people. He is not a distant God who is preoccupied with other things. 
Now he is a God that cares and is concerned about the life of his people. You do not have to live in fear in Daniel chapter 9. Gabriel referred to Daniel by his name in Luke 11.13. Gabriel the messenger referred to Zacharias by his name in Luke 1.30. Gabriel the messenger referred to Mary by her name. God knows your name, he knows. What you need, he knows where you are in life, never forget that. And the ministry of Gabriel reveals this wonderful truth to us we see in Daniel 10. 3. The Archangel Michael is described as, quote, one of the chief princes. This phrase suggests to us that if Michael is one of the chief princes, there are other chief princes that the Bible has remained silent. Regarding that is a plausible conclusion to reach unlike other angels whose identities are hidden in the Old and New Testaments. Michael's name is mentioned virtually everywhere he is featured in the Bible. The book of Revelation portrays Michael as an angel of warfare. He led the war against Satan and his angels in heaven and won the victory over them. Revelation 12, 7, 9 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed. Not neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Wherever Michael is mentioned in the Bible, he is mentioned as contending, fighting, or standing against evil spirits and principalities. He defends the things of God and the people of God. And we see this in a very important book of the Bible, the book of Daniel. In all the books of the Bible, both Michael and Gabriel are mentioned in one book. They are both mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, but only in one book are they both mentioned, Daniel 10, 7 to 13. And I, Daniel alone, saw the vision for the men that were with me, saw not the vision, but a great cue waking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. For my clinginess was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength, yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me up upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the word that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chosen thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I come for thy word words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. The angel that was sent to deliver the answer to Daniel's prayer was confronted by the prince of Persia for twenty-one days since this prince was able to oppose the angelic messenger to Daniel. We know this prince was more than a man. This prince prince was a spirit being. And the fact that this prince is called, quote, the prince of the kingdom of Persia suggests that Persia has a spirit being that represents it. The word prince has the idea of a ruler or authority. This fits in well with the New Testament idea that angelic ranks are organized and have a hierarchy. Ephesians 6 verse 2, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Apparently this was a high-ranking evil spirit as it had the power to oppose the answer to Daniel's prayer for 21 days. If you remember in the book of John on three separate occasions, Jesus referred to Satan as the prince of this world. This leads me to believe that, quote, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was no normal run-of-the-mill evil spirit, but a very powerful evil spirit that withstood this holy angel for 21 days until Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help the angel. Michael did not bring the answers to Daniel. He only delivered the angel from the attack of the prince of Persia. This means that angels have different ranks. The angel that was sent to Daniel had the answers to his prayers but could not overpower the evil spirit that withstood him. But Michael came to rescue him and ensured that the answers to Daniel's prayer was delivered to him. He acts as the leader of other angels. He has the strength to fight and to contend against evil spirits. He is very much a leader of other angels. We see this in the sense that he led other angels to fight the devil. And his angels in the book of Revelation. There is a spirit world around us which powerful forces that literally affect our world. Don't ever think for one second that what you see happening in our world today occurs in isolation. This passage of scripture just opens up the curtain slightly into what is happening in the spirit world right now. There are confrontations and battles between spirit beings happening this very moment. The prophet Daniel reveals to us that Michael has a direct connection with the nation of Israel. Moreover, he reveals that Michael will have a prominent role in the end time. Daniel 12, 1-3 says, 
And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which stand out for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that shall be found written in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. This means that Michael has the ministry to protect the nation of Israel during the Great Tribulation. He is not only a warrior angel, but Michael also has, has a special job in protecting Israel. God appointed Michael as a spiritual guardian over Israel. Right now, Michael is still standing for the children of Israel as he has always had. He is their protector, one angel of the Lord that God dispatched. Just one angel slew 185,000 men. Just one angel angels are not to be taken lightly typically when you see depictions of angels. They are soft, fluffy, cute, flowery creatures. Those are not angels that is unscriptural. Angels are powerful beings. Jude recorded how Michael contended with Satan for the body of Moses. Jude 1, 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said the Lord rebuke thee. This is the only Bible passage that clearly defines Michael as an archangel. Now there are some denominations and beliefs that preach that the Lord Jesus Christ is Michael the archangel. He is not Jesus, is not Michael the archangel. Nowhere in the Bible is Jesus identified as Michael or any other angel in Jude chapter 1 verse 9. Michael states, The Lord rebuke thee if the Lord Jesus Christ is indeed Michael. Why would he say the Lord rebuke thee? It would make more sense for him to say rather, I rebuke thee. This proves to us that Michael is not Jesus. As some groups have thought Jesus rebuked the devil in his own authority. But Michael did not. Michael the archangel though is only an angel. He is not God. Yes, he is a marvelous creature. Nevertheless, he is still a created being, and he should not be worshipped as great and heroic as Michael appears. He is just but a creation of God. He is not equal with God. Therefore, he should not be worshipped every time people attempt to bow and worship angels. In the Bible, they were forbidden by them. Angels are ministering spirits. Sometimes we don't even realize what God is doing for us. Psalm 91 one nine, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the highest shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings. Shalt thou trust his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the tear by night, nor for the arrow that fots by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wasted at noon. Day a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee only with thine eyes, shall thou? Behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord which is. My refuge, even the highest thy habitation, as believers we know that God is always with us, protecting us and guiding us through life challenges, but sometimes we don't even realize what God is doing for us. We may be going through a difficult situation, or facing a dangerous circumstance, and yet we emerge unscathed, not realizing that it was God who was watching over. Us today, I want to talk to you about the protection of God. The Bible tells us that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. When we put our trust in Him, we can be assured that He will protect us and keep us safe from harm. Psalm 91, 11 and 12 says, For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. This is a powerful promise from God, assuring us that He will send His angels to protect us from harm and keep us safe from danger. But sometimes we don't even realize that God is protecting us, we may be driving down the road not realizing that we narrowly avoided a dangerous accident. We may be walking home from work, not realizing that we were protected from a potential attack. We may be going through a difficult situation not realizing that God was working behind the scenes to protect us and guide us through it. This is why it's important for us to trust in God's protection, even when we don't see it. We may not always understand why certain things happen or why we go through certain trials, but we can be confident that God is always working for our good, even when we don't realize it. You and I know that God has angels, and the Bible tells us that He gives these angels charge over you. There are angels who have charge over you, who are keeping you in all your ways. Wherever you may be traveling, God's angels are watching over you on the way to work, on the way back home, on the way to the shops, 
or the way anywhere there is at least one angel watching over you, to this world. You do not matter to this world. You are irrelevant to this world. You are just another number or just another body. However, not to God, to God, you matter enough for him to assign his angels to watch over you. God has given them an assignment to watch over you. You matter, you matter, you matter to God. The truth is sometimes we don't even realize what God is doing for us and Christian tidy angels play a significant role in our lives and families, as well as in every area of our existence. As you listen to me right now, it is highly possible that at least one angel is present in your home. Isn't that wonderful Psalm 91? 11 to 12, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. We often overlook the angels mentioned in this part of the Bible. We don't think about the works they do to keep us safe. We should truly thank God for sending angels to protect us. The president has the secret service department protecting him, the best humans taking care of him. But you, on the other hand, have secret angels watching over you, covering your back. There are instances where God sent angels for special work. God sent angels too. Lot Lot was Abraham's nephew and they separated. Lot went to Sodom and Gomorrah. The sin of the people in those cities was so great that God decided to destroy them. Angels were sent to warn Lot about the impending destruction and to guide Lot and his family out of the city. Genesis 19. One states, and there came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom and Lot seeing them rose to meet them then, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. The primary task of these angels was to guide Lot's family out of the city that was destined for destruction. Genesis 19.16 further reveals, And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him outside the city. The angels of the Lord helped Lot's family to escape the city and be saved from its destruction. Just like that, God has also sent angels to you and your family to keep you safe from any evil that may threaten you. These angels are always present around you, never taking their eyes off you. There is an angel in your home in Jacob's dream. He saw angels going up and down a ladder. Sometimes we overlook the significance of the dream. The top of the ladder represents the Lord God himself. It means that these angels are constantly moving between heaven and earth, fulfilling their assigned tasks. They continually go forth from God's presence to carry out what they have been commanded to do. One of their responsibilities is to ensure the safety of you and your family. They are always present in your house watching over you. This is why you have nothing to worry about. God sent them to be with you. In Matthew 18.10, Jesus inset instructs us not to despise the little ones for their angels in heaven. Always behold the face of his Father. This emphasizes that there are angels assigned to watch over and protect God's children. These angels have constant access to the presence of God in heaven. Therefore, be assured that you and your family are under the watchful care of God's angels. They are present in your life and home, ensuring your well-being and guarding against harm. You can find comfort, comfort, and peace, knowing that God has sent them to be with you and protect you from any evil that may arise. Trust in His divine providence and rest in the knowledge that His angels are faithfully watching over you. The truth is sometimes we don't even realize what God is doing for us. Can you imagine the amount of time God has shielded you? The amount of time God has protected you and made a way for you? Isaiah 43 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shalt not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. This is a powerful promise of God's protection for his children. But notice that he doesn't say if you pass through the waters or if you walk through the fire, he says when. Because he knows that we will face trials and difficulties in this life. But he promises to be with us and protect us through them all. So even when we don't realize it, God is constantly working for our good and our protection. He is our loving Father who cares for us deeply and he will never leave us or forsake us. As Romans 8 verse 28 reminds us of, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God is not a man that he should lie to us. He said, when thou passes through the waters, I will be with thee, not an angel, not a person, but God himself. I will be there whatever you are going through right now. Realize that you are not alone. The presence of the Lord is with you. God wasn't just saying, I will be with you to comfort you or to console you. He is saying it because he will do what he has said. If God says he will be with you, he will be with you. Need to go back into the presence of God as believers. We know that God is our protector, our shield and our fortress. Psalm 91, two says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. 
But what we often forget is that God's protection is not always obvious or visible to us. Sometimes we don't even realize what God is doing for us. God is working behind the scenes, protecting us and guiding us in ways that we may never fully understand. Think about it. How many times have you been protected by God without even realizing it to end the sermon? I want to encourage you to pray I am here to tell you, go to Jesus. Go to the presence of the Lord. You have a God who loves you and cares. Find you a secret place and pour your heart to God. Pour out your heart to Him. He will hear you. He will hear you. People will only listen to you for so long and put up with you for so long. But you can spend time in the presence of the Lord. Even if you need to cry, you can cry in His presence. You can pour out your heart to the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 5, 7 Casting all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, and all your concerns once and for all on Him. For He cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully.